And today, um, <clears throat> Honorable Robert Hineke is, is going to give the invocation. Rob um, has joined the foundation to um, direct and serve, um, direct uh, and extend and grow uh, the litigation efforts of T Texas Public Policy Foundation, which is, is very exciting. And I know some of you yesterday perhaps heard about um, the recent first filing uh, of a challenge to the Bureau of Land Management for taking yeah. <coughs> private property um, owned and paid taxes on for, for decades. Um, and so um, we're very excited about that. Before he joined us, he was uh, county attorney of Kirk County. <coughs> And he began his legal career as a, um, an assistant attorney general in the general um, litigation division of, um, under, the, sec under the, the attorney general, Greg Abbott. He received his law degree from the um, University of Texas Law School and founded the Texas Law Republicans. Um, <laughs> so Rob, I welcome you this morning. Thank you, good morning. Uh, would you please bow your head and pray with me? Most merciful and heavenly Father, we come here today, we bow our heads to you in recognition of our obedience and, and servitude to you as our Lord and Savior. God, on such a beautiful, beautiful Texas morning, we just praise you for this amazing world that you have created here, uh, amazing world that you have given us to enjoy, that you have also given us the, the challenge and the imagination to explore from the depths of the sea bottom to the very stars themselves and and to do so lord you have provided such abundant and incredible resources here on this earth and and given us the the, the imagination and the intellect to be able to untap those and to expand on those for the betterment of our families and our communities and god just thank you for all of the blessings that you continue to unfold around us uh, thank you for the blessing of this gathering here for the opportunity to discuss the, the wonderful work that mankind has done, but only because of your blessing and only because of your grace. And in all things, Lord God, we, we thank you for, for being our Lord and our Savior and, and praise your name for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And in all things in your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Texas has a very large congressional delegation, as, as we all know, as the second most populous state, uh, state the second most populous state. Um, but we have today with us, um, in, in my judgment, um, a really extraordinary member of the Texas delegation. Um, a, in his past and in his, in his, in his present uh, roles in Congress, um, someone that has acted, and this to me is a very important distinction, acted as a statesman and not just a politician. And that's a very small group, I think, um, in, in most legislative bodies. Uh, Lamar Smith represents the 21st Congressional District. Um, he is now chairman of a very powerful committee with a broad, broad jurisdiction. The full name is uh, the Committee on, S on Science, Space, and Technology. Um, jurisdiction over all kinds of programs at NASA, Department of Energy, EPA, National Science Foundation, the FAA, and the Nas Nas National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, he also serves on the Judiciary Committee and the Homeland Security Committee, very, very important um, committees in Congress. He was ranked as the most effective member of the House in um, 2011 to 2012 in a, in a study jointly conducted by the University of Virginia and Vanderbilt. That's a, a very significant <clears throat> honor. And he was also named Policymaker of the Year by um, Politico for his work on patent reform. Um, he has taken on, he's used his, his authority as chairman of that committee to take on um, um, major, major problems in EPA's action um, like, um, like no chairman of the Science Committee I can recall. And it is vital that congressional or oversight in its most <clears throat> um, energetic way um, be used to challenge and resist um, the things that to me involve uh, gross manipulation of science. And in this, I speak of, um, 
uh, EPA's risk assessments by which they establish things like ozone standards and all of that. He's taken over many, many <clears throat> topics that are at the core of um, EPA's overreach. So we're very privileged to have you here this morning, Representative Smith, and we, we welcome you. Kathleen, thank you for that introduction, and let me say how nice it is to be with you this morning. Uh, you all are all natural friends, and I feel as if I'm in great company. And I have to say there's a bit of a push-pull factor here. Not only am I glad to be here in Austin this morning, I'm glad to be out of Washington, D.C. <laughs> as well. Um, and Kathleen's remarks, I have to, in the interest of uh, fair disclosure, uh, say that that wonderful study that she mentioned about effectiveness, I had never heard of until they mentioned me. Uh, now, of course, I think it was the most important study conducted last year, uh, but <laughs> sounded good. Uh, the other thing to mention is that you all, I hope, know how much we appreciate the Texas Public Policy Foundation. You all do great work. I don't know of anyone, certainly in Texas, who does better work, I put you on a level equal with Heritage and the other national organizations because anytime any work product comes from the Texas Public Policy Foundation, it is immediately given great credibility by Republicans and by conservatives, and I just can't thank you enough for all you do for so many people. And also, I have to say, helping to counter uh, what I consider to be a, a bias from the liberal side. So thank you for all that in many, many ways. Um, I have some prepared remarks, and I'm sort of in the school of, Bill Buckley used to say that he tried to pay the audience the compliment of making prepared remarks. And so I have that, but I'm also especially looking forward to, after I finish prepared remarks, looking forward to exchanging ideas with you on any subject that you want, and I will do my best to try to answer questions that you might have. <coughs> Um, by the way, just a, I, I keep talking about asides before I ever get to what I want to say, but um, Kathleen, you may know, is a breeder of championship, Jack Russells. And so we are negotiating my wife's and my next puppy. No, no. <laughs> uh, uh, it's only half facetious. Uh, the other thing, oh, speaking of, uh, speaking of being here with you and seeing that wonderful view of the Capitol you have from the balcony there, uh, something I never put in my bio, but it's of only minor interest, maybe on the scale of being even a trivia question, and that is I still hold the record for shortest term state rep in Texas history. And <clears throat> the reason that came about is because I won a special election in December. I can't, I honestly, I'm not sure whether it was 80 or 81. It must have been 81. No, in 1980, because the legislature met in 81. A uh, special election in mid-December of 1980 to succeed Jim Nallen, who became a federal judge. And the legislature, which was who, then in the uh, hands of um, the Democrats, met in January. And Bear County, which is my home, San Antonio, had to go from 11 to 10 state reps because our population increase had not kept up with the rest of the state. And who were they going to eliminate other than the junior Republican from San Antonio? So uh, I was duly elected in, in a special election mid-December. And uh, January or February, it actually might have been February, I was no longer a state rep. Uh, I never even got in office. Uh, I was in the foyer of another friend who let me sort of camp out there. And on the House floor, I actually, there were two one-week special sessions that I did attend, and so I did cast nine votes. Uh, and then was gone. But I didn't understand in a House which has an even number of members, 150, why there was only one chair back of the last row and I was there by myself. And I, d I never knew whether that was intentionally inflicted upon me uh, because I was in the minority for some uh, unknown punishment, but there I was, out of 150 people, I was by myself in a single row, the last seat in the House. So I hope that would have improved over time, but I never saw that time. But just so you know, if anybody asks you who holds a record for shortest term state rep, you might know the answer there too. Well, we are truly at a crossroads today when it comes to American energy production. Many of us in Congress want to take the path towards energy independence and prosperity. 
but the President and his extreme environmental allies remain with their do not pass signs. Perhaps a more appropriate sign to display for this administration would be for, quote, slower traffic to stay on the shoulder so that we can expedite policies that will continue our energy revolution and benefit our country. The Chairman of the Science, Space and Technology Committee, which has jurisdiction over federal agencies such as the EPA and the Department of Energy's Research and Technology Budget, and by the way, that's $8 billion that we oversee of the Department of Energy's Research and Development Budget. I try to take every action possible to blunt this administration's attacks on American energy. It is my committee's responsibility to ensure that the federal government is efficient, effective and accountable to the American people. Between the Environmental Protection Agency's expanded regulatory power under this administration and the Department of Energy's $8 billion energy research budget, we have our work cut out for us at the Science Committee. Time and again, EPA officials have dismissed Americans' right to know and have advanced expensive regulations without releasing the data they use to justify these burdensome rules. EPA senior officials have been held in contempt of court, used secret email accounts, and mishandled Freedom of Information Act request. Today, the same discredited EPA now seeks to pursue the most aggressive regulatory agenda in its 44-year history. One regulation that is on the horizon is the Obama administration's sweeping new electricity regulation, the so-called Clean Power Plan. The President's power plan is nothing more than a power grab to give the government more control over Americans' daily lives. The rule will go into effect at the end of December. This is the administration's unwelcome gift just in time for the holiday season. This power plan will cost billions of dollars, cause financial hardship for American families, and diminish the competitiveness of American industry around the world, all with no significant benefit. The President's power plan will have a negative impact on Texas. According to the updated Energy Reliability Council of Texas, that was released last month, the Clean Power Plan will result in increased wholesale and retail energy costs in Texas. Based on ERCOT's analysis, energy costs for customers may increase by up to 16 percent each year due to this regulation alone. So this rule represents massive cost without significant benefits. In other words, it's all pain and no gain. The EPA justifies its dictatorial approach by claiming its regulations will slow global climate change and reduce carbon emissions. But heavy-handed regulations and arbitrary emission targets will do lasting damage to our economy. And even the Obama administration admits that the rule will have little to no impact on global temperatures. <clears throat> EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy testified before the Science Committee and agreed that this rule would have a minimum impact on climate. In fact, EPA's own data shows that this regulation would eliminate less than 1 percent of global carbon emissions and would reduce sea level rise by only one one-hundredth of an inch, the thickness of three sheets of paper. We can protect health and promote economic growth at the same time. Contrary to what this administration may suggest, these are not mutually exclusive goals. Regulatory mandates and picking winners and losers in the energy marketplace only benefits this administration and its extreme environmentalist allies, not the American people. Furthermore, statements by President Obama and others that attempt to link extreme weather events to climate change are unfounded. The lack of evidence is clear. No increased tornadoes, no increased hurricanes, no increased droughts or floods. The administration's claims are contradicted by the underlying science from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change itself. For instance, the IPCC found that there is, quote, low confidence on a global scale, end quote, that drought has increased in intensity or duration. The same lack of evidence can be found in the IPCC reports for almost every parameter of extreme weather events. Hurricanes have not increased in the U.S. in frequency, intensity, or normalized damage since at least 1900. It has been a decade since a Category 3 or stronger hurricane has hit the U.S. And whether measured by the number of strong tornadoes, tornado-related fatalities, or economic losses associated with tornadoes, the later half of the 20th century shows no climate-related trend. Americans are tired of the administration's scare tactics. 
Using this rhetoric to impede the development of American coal and natural gas will cost our communities jobs, our state's revenue, and burden all Americans with higher energy costs. The science is clear and overwhelming, but not in the way the President says. The fact is there is little evidence that climate change causes extreme weather events. Since the EPA continues to proceed with inflexible new climate regulations and impose limits on the use of innovative technologies that could help us develop our natural resources, even worse, the administration fails to consider the negative impacts these regulations will have on the American economy. America runs on affordable, reliable energy. Here in Texas, we understand this concept perhaps better than in any other area of the country. We can't afford to derail our economy for a plan that simply won't stop climate change, even if that were necessary. And we can't overlie, regulate, overly regulate our safe domestic energy production. That's why I will continue to resist President Obama's regulatory agenda. And I will work to require more transparency, sound science, and accountability to the American people. <clears throat> Thank you. Earlier this year, the House passed H.R. 1030, the Secret Science Reform Act, which I sponsored. This legislation requires the EPA to base its regulations on publicly available data. Why would the EPA want to hide this information from the American people? The EPA has a responsibility to be open and transparent with the people it serves and whose money it spends. Another example of how this administration attempts to promote its suspect climate agenda can be seen at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Its employees altered historical climate data to get politically correct results in an attempt to disprove the hiatus in global temperature increases. NOAA conveniently issued its news release promoting this report just as the Obama administration was about to announce its extensive climate change regulations. When the Science Committee raised concerns about NOAA's report, the agency refused to be transparent about its findings and provide documents to the committee. The American people should be suspicious of the motives of this administration as it continually impedes congressional oversight of agency actions tied to its extreme climate agenda. In just a few weeks, world leaders will gather in Paris to discuss how to regulate carbon emissions. The Obama administration touts the Clean Power Plan as the cornerstone of its promise to the international community to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, the U.S. pledge to the U.N. is estimated to prevent only three one-hundredths of one degree Celsius temperature rise. This is laughable, even if the negative consequences are serious. There is a reason the President chose to bypass Congress in order to negotiate a climate deal on his own. The President's plan ignores good science and only seeks to advance a partisan political agenda. The President should come back to Congress with any agreement that is made in Paris on carbon emissions. He won't because he knows the Senate will not ratify it. The burdensome regulations from this administration ignore the President's promise to support an all-of-the-above energy strategy. Apparently, the President really means all of the energy above the ground. We remain at a crossroads. Our path leads to affordable, reliable American energy, the other path to costly regulations under the guise of addressing global climate change. But providing accurate information on climate change is not important to climate change alarmists. Their agenda comes first, facts come second, if at all. That is why we need the Texas Public Policy Foundation to fight against federal government overreach and continue to provide the facts about President Obama's extreme environmental agenda to the American people. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to be with you. And uh, let me again thank you for all you do to ensure that Texans continue to have access to reliable, affordable energy. Thank you. <clears throat> And uh, look, Kathleen, yes, uh, am, is the mic loud enough? I was a little bit worried about that. Okay. Uh, do you all have comments or questions for me? And if we, do we have plenty of time for this? Or some time? Yes, we do. Or marginal time? Okay. Yes, we'll go around the room. This may seem a very, uh, <clears throat> this may seem a very naive question from a political outsider, but to me it has just always been, it seemed like a no-brainer that if tax money pays for your work, all of your work, 
100% of the work paid for by that tax money is public property and ought to be fully open to inspection by the public's representatives. What are the reasonings behind the refusal of NOAA and NASA and the like to open up all of the background documents from, for instance, Tom Carl's okay. study? Uh, let me give you some background on this. In the last Congress, we invited the President's Science Advisor, Dr. Holdren, to testify before the committee. And because I'm chairman, I get to ask the first question. My first question to Dr. Holdren was, shouldn't the American people see the data that the EPA, I was talking about the EPA specifically then, but shouldn't the American people see the data that the EPA claims justifies these burdensome and unnecessary and expensive regulations? And Dr. Holdren, in his response, not only said yes, but said yes, the American people paid for it, they should see it. That did not last long, uh, because on the strength of that, I wrote the administrator of the EPA a letter, said I'd like to see the data underlying some of these regulations. Uh, that was refused. Uh, that led to my first subpoena. And I'm the first Science Committee chairman in 21 years to issue a subpoena. And that first one was directed at the EPA. Uh, by the way, as of last week, I'm now up to eight. So you can tell I am warming to the task. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, I, the bill that I just mentioned in my comments, the Secret, sci the secret uh, Science Bill, uh, Ha which says it doesn't take a position on any regulation. It simply says that no regulation can go into effect unless the underlying data has been publicly disclosed. That way it can be peer reviewed, the American people can see it, their representatives can see it, and so forth. To me, it is about as common sense of a bill, commonsensical of a bill as you can imagine. It passed the House, it's passed a committee in the Senate, it is now stuck, and while it's waiting floor action, uh, and so many Democrats have opposed it, they have not been able to bring it up on the Senate floor. By the way, when it passed the House, the President threatened a veto of the bill. This is a bill that sought to incorporate exactly what his science advisor had testified to a year before. So uh, obviously admission, the administration feels threatened uh, by a bill that forces them to uh, practice what they preach. The President came into office you know, promising the most transparent administration in history, and it's just the opposite that we see unfolding uh, before us. But um, good question. Thanks. Uh, too many questions. We'll go around there as quickly as we can. Yes. Sir, let me encourage you to include in that disclosure requirement the source code for all software used to manipulate the data so that software engineers can check and make sure that their algorithms are right. correct. We're, we're aware of that. It's not specific, but we're aware of that. Yes. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being here. My, my name is Keith Pauley. I'm from the Cardinal Institute in West Virginia. And, um, uh, Administrator McCartney is, is going around the United States doing uh, public hearings on the Clean Power Plan. And she has been invited to West Virginia uh, by our congressional delegation and by our governor. Yes. And uh, she's declined to come because she says she doesn't feel safe in West Virginia because it is truly ground zero of the war on coal. So could, could you help us by encouraging her to actually go <laughs> where these policies most uh, yeah, have impacted the yeah, average yeah, citizen? No, no doubt she would be <laughs> much more informed if she did so, and I certainly would encourage her to do that. You were, you were exactly right. Uh, by the way, just to give you a little bit back, background on the power plant, um, um, the power plan, uh, when she appeared before the committee this year, um, again, my first question to her was, using the own data that we've obtained from the EPA, uh, it looks like to me that the power plan would have absolutely no impact on climate change. And she didn't deny that. I didn't have time to go into it a minute while ago. Her only response was, well, we simply need to show action. So they were willing to impose a burden on the American people that is going to cost tens of thousands of dollars, tens of billions of dollars, tens of thousands of jobs, all for no real reason other than, quote, we need to show action. It, uh, that was picked up by Fox, and it was about as weak of a response as you could have imagined. But those are the kinds of responses we get from the EPA uh, these days. Sorry to say. Yes. The, uh, Hello. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Okay. Uh, many of us here are former government employees, uh, veterans of our NASA Apollo program. In our experience as government employees, especially exploring, was to regularly have 
outside reviews of the science that we were using to make decisions about sending right. astronauts to the moon and back. And I've been through numerous of these kind of reviews where I would give a presentation and experts that, that were totally objective could grill me on why we were making certain decisions or doing analysis. This is what I want to see with the EPA. A number of us ex-NASA guys have looked at what they've done. We know where the cracks are in their analysis. We'd like to grill them and expose them for the fraud that they're putting on the American people. You've just described what I want to do, too. Uh, <laughs> so maybe we can work together on that. Uh, and I'm always open for suggestions. But you reminded me, and I think your point there about the critical analysis is an excellent one because perhaps the most trenchant comment I've ever heard in the last several months, I was up, I'd probably not give it away, you'll be able to track down who it was, but it, I was up in the Boston area a few months ago getting briefed, uh, and I was briefed by a number of individuals, one of whom is very um, liberally disposed towards climate change and feels that human activity has caused almost all of it and so forth. But he said to me at the end of our briefing, he said, Lamar, remember, there is a huge distinction between environmentalist and climate scientist. I think he wanted to defend his own profession. He said the environmentalists are the activists. They're the ones who exaggerate. They're the ones who are certain. Uh, they're the ones who are happy to make predictions for what's going to happen 100 years from now or 200 years from now. He said a real climate scientist does not exaggerate, knows nothing is certain, welcomes critiques. They always want to have their thesis or hypothesis uh, challenged as, you, as part of the scientific uh, method. And by the time he finished, I realized for the first time the huge distinction between the activists who, have ever, who are certain of everything and the climate scientists, uh, as, and he was speaking for himself, he said, Lamar, we don't know what the weather's going to be in two weeks, much less in 20 years or 85 years by the end of the century. So when you have someone like that trying to remind you of the difference between the two, that's what it comes that back to. But again, as he said, a scientist believes in the scientific method, they're never certain, they don't exaggerate, and that's the exact opposite of the environmentalist. Question for you. Why, why does Congress... Where is it? Mr. Smith. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Why does Congress keep letting uh, the president and the executive branch get away with these ridiculous actions? Uh, that's a fairly direct question. I, I, like to think it, I like to think it's not entirely our fault, but uh, the reason he gets away with more than he should have get away with is simply because of our constitutional form of government. I don't think there's any other response. Oftentimes we will pass measures in the House, whether it be to defund, to oppose, uh, to um, uh, reform, to uh, anything. And we can't get that action, that bill, that uh, defunding through the Senate. And you all know the, um, the math here as well as I do. In the Senate, if one senator threatens to put a hold on a bill and threatens to filibuster a bill, that one senator requires, uh, means that you have to get 60 votes to bring anything up on the Senate floor, even an amendment, much less a piece of legislation. And so uh, we need 60 votes in the Senate to get anything to the President's desk. We have 54 Republicans. Even if they all hold together, we still need six more Democrats. We thought it was going to be easier to do than has, has transpired. Uh, Harry Reid has them uh, in lockstep. And we might get one or two, perhaps someone from West Virginia, Senator Manchin, for example. Uh, but we have found it almost impossible to get six more Democrats to join uh, the Republicans to try to approve something in the Senate that the House has approved and get it to the President's desk. There's nothing more I would like to do than put a lot of legislation on the President's desk. Despite the threatened vetoes, I cannot imagine a President would actually veto a piece of legislation that gives the American people more information, for example. So that's part, that's part of the frustration. Well, uh, I think the Senate should change the rules if you want to know the truth. Uh, about uh, six weeks ago, after, I, after the Iran deal was disapproved in the House and stymied in the Senate because they couldn't get 60 votes to bring up the Iran deal, I circulated a letter among my Texas, uh, not just Texas, among my Republican colleagues 
uh, and wrote a letter to the Senate leaders uh, asking them to consider in certain instances changing the filibuster rule. And I pointed out in democracy uh, a majority rules, not a 60 percent supermajority. So we ought to be able to bring up some legislation on the Senate floor with 51 votes, not 60 votes. So I wrote the Senate leaders. That's, that's all I wrote suggesting that. And as I said, I think I had 57 other Republicans sign on the letter just in an hour or two. I probably could have gotten a lot more with more time. Uh, but I was so frustrated by that Iran deal and the lack of a vote in the Senate. <clears throat> My reward for doing that uh, was that a chief of staff of one of the Senate leaders called my chief of staff to tell me how wrong I was and I should never attempt to interfere with Senate rules. That was not my business. Uh, another senator, Republican senator, wrote all 256 of my Republican colleagues in the House and said basically the same thing. Um, so uh, what happened was that about two weeks later or three weeks later, uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Senator McConnell, uh, decided to appoint a task force to study how they could change the filibuster rule. Uh, one of the senators appointed to that task force was a senator who had written all 257 Republicans in the House. So uh, you, uh, I'm still waiting for that letter of apology. I'm not sure when I'm going to get it. But in any case, I, maybe there'll be some movement over there to help that situation. Yes, sir. Well, okay, yeah. Congressman Smith, on my uh, commute home, I uh, a lot of times hear you on the Joe Pag show oh, at yeah. a WRI in San Antonio, and you know he's got a, <clears throat> a nationwide network of radio stations that listen to me. Uh, my question is: Are you on any other similar type of nationwide radio networks other than his? where your message and what you can say to the American oh, people gets uh, out. You are nice. In fact, I was on PAG's night before last as well. I, I like him tremendously. He does um, a lot to sort of counter the liberal bias in the national media, too, uh, which is a whole other subject. Uh, but you asked me, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm on local, obviously, local um, radio, both in Austin and in San Antonio. and. Um, I'm on Fox fairly frequently. Um, I'm going to be on Hannity. Uh, we're taping something tomorrow afternoon. Oh, this afternoon, pardon me, for I guess tonight over the weekend. Uh, so you just sort of pick it up where you can. What's interesting to me is that uh, the, about the only TV stations, for example, who that will cover Republicans is basically Fox. We almost never get coverage on the three networks, even though they have far more viewership than Fox does, as good as Fox is. Uh, so that's part of that liberal <laughs> media bias that they really don't want to hear the other side on the three networks. Yes? I think this is the last question. Okay. okay. Uh, Congressman, uh, I'm Bob Murray of Murray Energy. And uh, you recognize the name. I very much appreciate what you are doing. I'm following your tracks very carefully. I'm the Murray on the Murray Energy lawsuit against the destructive, expensive power plan, and where we've been joined by 26 states. I wanted you to be aware of something. Day before yesterday, a federal judge granted my permit to, or my permission to subpoena. Uh, under oath, Gina McCarthy. Now, I probably won't get anywhere because she's known to lie, uh, but we're making progress, but I'm following what you're doing. And I can tell you on behalf of a lot of coal miners and a lot of people in the communities of this country that do bring the energy up from underground, you are very much respected. I don't have a question for you. From that podium, I was the luncheon speaker yesterday, and you happen to be here in my remarks. I want to thank you a whole lot. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I can't ask for a better ending than that, so thank you. Whoa, and I know we need to keep on schedule, but just as we're leaving here and uh, join, joining in the auditorium for the first uh, panel, think of the magnitude of this issue and the magnitude of the task that uh, Chairman Smith is taking on when, when um, unelected um, parties in the federal government or elected parties in the federal government are willing to manipulate science, grossly manipulate science, and so that they're having the bully, pu bully pu pulpit, their reach 
um, is, is, is vast in, 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 in what the kind of propaganda that is fed um, to, the, um, to the public. But this is key not only to the, to the, the uh, recognition of the necessity and importance of, of energy in this country, but to our constitutional order. And you don't have to look very far back in history to see um, in some of the most horrific political regimes in the world, which would include Stalin's and Hitler's and all of that, the way science uh, manipulated and science si silenced, science silenced, within the same week or so that Chairman Smith was sending subpoenas um, to NOAA or NASA, um, an attorney general in New York State was um, trying to subpoena parties and to try in a, in a uh, procedure to criminalize even questioning uh, certain science. So the stakes on this are, they are not to, um, you know, speak histrionically, they're civilizational. Uh, the protection of the integrity of science is absolutely found uh, fundamental to our freedom. And our next panel is a very exciting one on that because um, the scientists and engineers that had a great empirical test of whether their science was right in that they put man on the moon and brought him back safely. So um, the right stuff on climate will speak later and, and they are a, a really fascinating, inspirational voice about, about what it means to protect the integrity of science, as is Chairman Smith. Thank you, sir.